بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in the Hadith of Muslim he said من سلك طريقا يلتمس فيه علما سهل الله له به طريقا إلى الجنة the whoever treads upon a path of seeking knowledge Allah سبحانه وتعالى will make his path to Jannah easy for him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Ibn Majah, which is authenticated by Albani, he said, طالب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم That seeking Islamic knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim. And Imam Ahmad was asked, which type of knowledge is obligatory upon a person to learn? And the, uh, Imam Ahmad said, ما يقوم به دينه That knowledge with which a person's religion can stand upright. And then he gave examples such as, your salah, your fasting, your Hajj because these things are the fundamental things in your religion and they are also those things which you are required to do a number of times in a day or in a week or in a year so in Salah a minimum of five times we pray fasting every single year we pray so learning about these things especially when it comes to Salah it's obligatory upon us to know about because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says to us, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn or mankind except to worship me. Now this worshipping me is split into two types. Firstly, or two knowledges. Firstly, it's split into al aqidah which is to learn about the one who you are worshipping. The one you are worshipping. That's aqidah. Then we have the science of al-fiqh, which is after you know about the one who you are worshipping worshipping, then you need to know how to worship this one there's no point just knowing and then coming and not knowing how to worship because then that will not be accepted so you have to learn about uh, this so the course that we're doing over today and tomorrow is known as fiqh of salah fiqh of salah now this is made up of two words the first word is fiqh and the second word is as salah so what does the word fiqh mean? Linguistically, the word fiqh means al-fahm. It means understanding. That's why the Prophet sallallahu said in hadith, "Man yuridillahu bi khayran yufaqihu fi din." That whoever Allah subhanahu wa taala wants good for, He will give him the fiqh of the religion, i.e., the understanding of the religion. And in the famous du'a, "Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hli uqda min lisani yafqahu qawli." Allow my speech to be uh, understood. So this is all from the word fiqh, from the linguistic perspective. Islamically or technically, what does fiqh mean? The ulama give a definition of fiqh. And definitions when it comes to the, uh, Islam is very, very important to know. And so in, uh, in the point, the point he says, إِنَّ مُبَارِيَ كُلِّ فَنِنَ عَشَرَ الْحَدُّ وَالْمَوْضُوعُ ثُمَّ الثَّمَرَ He describes the word definition as had a boundary. Why? Because anything which fits inside this boundary, that is considered whatever thing you are defining. So in terms of fiqh, anything which comes in this definition or this boundary of fiqh or which is part of this definition, then it is fiqh. Anything which is not concur with any of anything mentioned in this definition, then that is not considered fiqh. So the ulama say fiqh istilahan or shara'an is ma'rifatul ahkam al-shara'iyyah العمليه بادلتها التفصيليه معرفه الاحكام الشرعيه العمليه بادلتها التفصيليه which in english is knowing the practical islamic rulings with its detailed evidences knowing the practical islamic rulings with it, with its detailed evidences so each of these words give us a meaning when it comes to uh, this definition so what's the first word knowing Meaning it's a type of knowledge. It's a type of knowledge that you have to know. Then he says, or the ulama say, ma'rifatul ahkam, it's the rulings. So anything which is not considered a ruling in Islam, then that, is, that does not come under the science of fiqh. So for example, a story. A story, when you find stories in the uh, books of fiqh, you won't find stories in the books of fiqh, unless that story tells us a ruling. Otherwise, it's general stories you won't find in the books of fiqh. And what types of rulings? as shariah Islamic rulings. Islamic rulings. So anything which is not Islamic will not un come under uh, this definition. Ma'rifat al-hakam al-shariah al So what type of Islamic rulings? 
al-amal, those actions that you have to do. So what type of rulings? Those rulings which are pertaining to your actions. And not those which are pertaining to beliefs or to Arabic grammar or to anything else. Those that pertain to your beliefs, which science is that? That's the science of Al-Aqeedah. That's the science of Al-Aqeedah. So if you want to know what do we have to know about the Malaika, for example, will you find that in the books of Fiqh? You won't find that in the books of Fiqh because that's not something that I... Um, that has to do with your actions. Yes, obviously, Aqeedah and Tawheed, that's the of your actions, but Tawheed only goes to the extent of the belief, and obviously, yeah, it shows on your limbs, but when it does show on your limbs, that's when you go to the books of Fiqh. You want to worship Allah? Okay, how do you worship Allah? Then you go to the books of Fiqh. And then finally, we add Latiha at Tafsiliya, with its specific proofs, and this is the difference between this and Usul al Fiqh, which you're not going to go into too much. Uh, what basically means specific evidences, meaning every single action that we do has a specific uh, delil for it. Zuhr is for rak'at, we have a delil for it. P putting the hands on a certain place, we have a delil for it. To say certain things in the rukur, we have a delil for it. Every specific action has a specific delil. So this is the Islamic definition that the ulama give of fiqh. Now the books of fiqh generally, they split into four parts. The books of fiqh are split into four parts. The first is known as Al-Ibadat. Al-Ibadat means uh, your worship. The second is known as Al-Mu'amalat, transactions. The third is Al-Nikah. And the fourth is Al-Janayat, criminal law. So when it comes to Al-Ibadah, the first part of uh, fiqh, then this is where you'll find uh, your worship. So salah, fasting, hajj, zakah. This is what this part of fiqh talks about. So, and if you notice, the way this is ordered, the ibadat are ordered, are in the same order of the five pillars of Islam. However, the first pillar of Islam, which is shahada, is not mentioned. Why? Why is shahada not mentioned? Good. If you go back to the definition we gave, it doesn't pertain to action. So it's not part, part of fiqh. So regarding the shahada, what, what books will you go to? Hmm? Books of aqidah. Books of aqidah, yes. So the first chapter, or the first book you'll find in fiqh is normally at tahara which is a, fru, uh, a, a branch from uh, salah. Because you can't uh, pray salah without having wudu. And because due to the fact that Tahara has so many masail, the ulama split it, uh, make it its own uh, book. So we start off with Tahara, cleansiness, uh, purification, and then Salah, and then Zakah, and then fasting, and then Hajj. Then we have Mu'amalat, which is just transactions, buying and selling, and so on. And then after that we have Nikah, and this is Nikah, Talaq, Idda, uh, Khula, all of these masail, and finally Janayat, which is criminal law. What's the punishment for this, what's the punishment for that, and so on. So if we, for example, we had, let's say we had a book which is four volumes. Each volume had one part of fiqh. If I wanted to find out the masala of, I said this to my wife, is, is it a talaq or not? Which volume would I go to? The third one, regarding nikah. If I went to, okay, I did this whilst I was fasting. Is my fast broken or not? Which volume would I go to? The first volume. And which, uh, which book in, in the first volume? The book of? Fasting, the book of fasting, very good. So this is regarding al-fiqh. So this is the first word. The second word is as-salah. As-salah. Now salah linguistically means ad-du'a. It means supplication. Linguistically, salah means ad-du'a. And Islamically, it means the specific actions that a Muslim does, which starts with the takbir and ends with at-taslim. Obviously, you can't mention the whole of salah be too long, so that's the definition. There's no known acts in Islam which start with the takbir, saying Allahu Akbar, and end with taslim, saying Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Now, this is salah. And we all know without any doubt that salah is obligatory upon us to learn. Like Ibn Qayyim says, anything which is obligatory to do is obligatory to learn about. And also the qa'id in the religion, مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبُ That thing which the wajib is not completed with, except with that, then that thing is also wajib. 
if you can't pray properly without learning, then learning is also obligatory for you to uh, do. Just like wudu. Can you pray salah without wudu? You can't. So wudu is also obligatory. Same way as salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first, uh, the first question that we've asked about Yom Al-Qiyamah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is regarding the prayer. And when the, the people who enter hellfire and people who enter uh, paradise, uh, the people in paradise will say to the people in hellfire, مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ What made you enter the hellfire? And they will say, the first answer, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُوا مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ We weren't from those who prayed. And here what happens, shaitan comes to us and he says, you know you, you've got a beard, you're a hijab, you pray five times a day, so you don't need to worry about this. You don't need to worry about this. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ma'un, a surah which all of us have memorized, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ That's going to be destruction and punishment for those who pray. Think about that. Allah says, those who pray will be punished. Does that make sense? It does if you read the next ayah. أَلَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ those who are neglectful when it comes to their prayers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Maryam, فَخَلَّفًا بَعْدٍ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُ الصَّلَةِ وَاتَّبَعُ الشَّهْوَاتِ فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّ That those who have lost their prayer and follow their desires, they will be thrown into Al-Ghay. And uh, I think Ibn Abbas or, or Al-A'mash, they say that Al-Ghay is a specific valley in the hellfire which is made out of blood and pus. Made out of blood and pus. And 82 times in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Aqimu salah. He says, establish the prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say pray the prayer, He says, establish the prayer. Meaning, make sure you pray it properly. With all its conditions, with all khushur, with all its obligations, on time, if you're a man in jama'ah. If all of these things aren't there, then you should fear for yourself that is the salah actually accepted. And we all know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna salat tanha al fahsha'i wal munkar that the salah prohibits us from falling into sins and evil and disgusting actions. If you're still falling into these actions, think about your salah. Is that salah actually having an effect? If it's not having an effect, then think about the quality of that salah that you are praying. So that's why it's vital for every Muslim to learn about the salah. So even most of the things that we're going to mention, most of them you might have heard before. But that doesn't mean that you don't attend because there might be things, there might be one thing that you learn and that is the cause for you or for your salah not to be accepted. That there's one thing you're doing wrong and your salah was not accepted due to that uh, reason. And even the munafiqoon, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the munafiqoon, إِنَّ الْمَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ That the hypocrites are in the deepest and darkest pits of hellfire. And how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe their salah? وَإِذَا قَامُوا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ قَامُوا Kusala, yura'una nasa wa la yadhkuruna Allah illa qalila. That they, when they get up to pray, they get up in a lazy fashion. They don't pray properly. They only pray because, you know, maybe somebody's watching them, maybe they're getting forced, their dad's watching them. That's the only reason they pray. That prayer is not prayed uh, properly, it's not established. That's why even before the salah, what does the Imam say? He made the many different say, sayings. He says, it's to uh, make the uh, sufuf uh, straight. Because from the establishing of the prayer So it starts even before you start the prayer You have to line it properly And if that is not done Then you should fear that am I actually establishing the prayer And my prayer, is my prayer actually uh, accepted So with that inshallah we'll start the book The book that we're going through Is uh, called Shurutu Salah Wa Wajibatuha Wa Arkanuha You've been given these uh, handouts and uh, they've been made a bit small and apparently tomorrow inshallah, if you just keep these for today, tomorrow they're going to give out some uh, bigger ones inshallah. Uh, if there's not enough space to write on this, then write on a uh, separate piece of paper inshallah. Uh, the book is called Shurutu Salah Wa Wajibatuha Wa Arkanuha. The conditions of the prayer and its obligations and its pillars. And these are things which every single Muslim should know. What are the conditions for my salah to be accepted? What are the obligations that I have to do in salah? What are the uh, pillars in my salah? And this, even a small kid, uh, even if he's not valid, if he reaches either 7 or 10, you should start teaching him these books. You should start teaching him uh, these books. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Order your uh, children 
to pray when they reach, uh, reach the age of seven. And how are they going to pray if they don't know? So from then, you should start teaching them how to pray. So books like this, simple books like this, should be taught. And many uh, kids in Masjid Nabi in Medina, you find that even small kids who, maybe at the age of seven, they've memorized books like this. Forget study, they've memorized books like this. And uh, if anybody memorizes this book, they'll come to me, I can give him a jaza, inshallah, which is from Shaykh al-Masjid Qasim, going back to the author. And I think between me and Shaykh Qasim, there's only four people going back to the uh, author. And we had the Dora uh, previously, and I mentioned again, for those Mutun uh, Talibi Ilm Mustawal, anybody memorized it, uh, come to me today or tomorrow, and if you memorize it, inshallah, I can give you a jazza in those books uh, also. So the book is written by uh, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab ibn Sulaiman at Tamimi, who was born in the year 1115 and passed away in the year 1206. And we don't have time to go into his biography. However, he's the same author who wrote Kitab al Tawheed, the same one who wrote Usul uh, al Qad Arba and Waqt al Islam, and uh, many other books. And he wrote this book upon the madhab of the uh, Hanabila, which is, and most of it are basic things that most of everything which is mentioned in this book is agreed upon by uh, everybody. However, he, he wrote it because he himself and those in, uh, in his time, they were upon the madhab of the Hanabila of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who was born in the year uh, 164 and passed away in the year 241. Uh, So some ulama, they say that even leaving off one prayer, like that person's a kafir. 